All right, welcome everyone to the Ex Umbros podcast. Scholar McClarney, and with me is uh, Schoolman Fawcett, fellow teacher at the online Chesterton Academy, known as Chesterton Academy, Academy of Saint Isidore Learning Center, uh, the world's only online Chesterton Academy. Uh, this podcast is classical Catholic education in podcast form, where uh, even those of you who don't go to Chesterton Academy of Saint Isidore Learning Center get to experience what it's like to have uh, an online class in the, in this case, theology. And Bible study. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we last uh, episode we were talking about Psalm three and how when David fled before the face of Absalom and how that all unfolded in yeah. in David's life. And I don't know about you, but that got me thinking a little more yeah. about well, what exactly is going on in David's life? Yeah, that's right. So in Psalm three, I mean, in that episode, quickly we went through Psalm three, which is supposed to have been set, let's say, during David's flight from Absalom. So we give an overview of the story of Absalom's rebellion against David and explain how that ex- illuminates Psalm 3 and then connected that to the story of Jesus Christ. But uh, in reviewing that story, I think we both realized, wow, there is so much here in this. Um, yeah. uh, the, what would you call it? The Absalom cycle? Or sure, what, what if you, you want to think of it that way. Yeah, Second yeah. Samuel around well, chapter what, 13 to around chapter 19. There's so much there that... But, ooh, this deserves a whole episode yeah. of its own. And, you know? and we've talked about this before, but there, there's a few ways of looking at, at any passage of Scripture. So we want to relate it, uh, well, generally, if we're going to look at from a Christological angle, we're gonna look, how does, what does this relate to the Word, the Logos, <clears throat> Christ himself? Uh-huh. Particularly, we're working anywhere in the Psalms. But we can look at it elsewhere in passages as we've done before, whether it's Esther or, in this case, in, in Second Samuel and, and whatnot. Uh-huh. Another thing we usually want to do is look at, well, all right, what does this have to do with me? So we've talked yes. about this before. The Through the particular, there is a universal message. And this will tie us back into the overarching drama of salvation history. It's, it's one of the allurements I found uh, with uh, Augustine's sermons. Is when he's preaching, he's always going to create this, this I call it a hermeneutic of alignment. but Or hermeneutic of continuity. Uh, but, but basically what that means is there's a continuity Augustine's going to draw for his le- readers or his listeners. He's going to establish this baseline where we are part of this uh, pilgrimage from the prophets of old, the psalmist, uh, the the apostles, the martyrs into our own day, the saints, and so on. And us just listening now to uh, the, the scripture being read and expounded mm-hmm. upon. So there's this dynamic a dynamism that we're drawn into as we're marching towards Zion above. Uh, we're all the, the, the just men are, are um, resigned and abound in praise of God. So but not everyone makes it. Uh, and so as Augustine will always create this tension. So it's not like we're just reading it. So we're, we've made it there already. Uh, there's yeah. this uh, tension between the city of God mm. and the city of earth. So when we're reading scripture, I think this tension is important to keep in mind when we look at the story of David. Uh, and so usually we think of, um, well, the new David, when we ever hear the word David, right? Uh, Jesus uh, from the tribe of Judah and so on. And last time we mentioned some very important parallels. So, uh, Which I'm sure will emerge again as we go through the story. Yeah, well, well, if we were focused on, yeah, well, but, but so for instance, the Kidron Valley, like Jesus uh, passes through the Kidron Valley just as David does. He weeps as he goes to uh, the Mount of Olives. Uh, there's the, his betrayer uh, hangs himself uh, right and, and so on and he endures insults from others so shimmy and, and others and we'll go if, 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 if we'll go through all this don't worry everybody. well, well I think, we're well, going through it rapidly yeah, no but here, we touched but, on that last time sure, right, i think sure, with, yeah. with 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 david right sure, uh, sure, yeah. but well, i guess what i'm trying to get at is there's elements that we might want to call it the dark side of david mm-hmm. uh they're the flaws which which are there in david and i mean it's not just to mm-hmm. you know point out people's flaws or something like this as if as an act of pride oh look how you know he messed up here and he did this that and the other uh in, in that sort of haughty sense mm-hmm. but i think there's a heuristic value there there's a certain um, witness of scripture that it prompts and prods our hearts to um well to to, to realize our weaknesses and, and not not for the point of pointing out that we're feeble but for the um for the sake of strengthening us and, and redirecting our hearts, our minds above. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a bit of a prelude, but basically mm-hmm. what I want to do is try and get to some of these um, these weaknesses and, and put it in the context of salvation history and as well as um, see, well, what can we, what can we learn from this? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. again, that the, uh, 
The procedure there is uh, you start with the literal, the historical meaning, and then on top of that you have the three spiritual meanings, uh, the moral meaning, the allegorical meaning, which would be like the Christological meaning, yeah. and the anagogical meaning. And I think you, yeah. you've already alluded to the moral meaning and the allegorical meaning. Uh, and so I think first of all, we'll, you know, well, we'll, we'll, sure we'll weave back and forth, but yeah. we'll go yeah. through the literal meaning of it. And as we're doing so, uh, we can we we'll, we'll there will be no way not to talk about the allegorical, yeah. moral, yeah. and maybe anagogical. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and those story. yeah, those are very helpful. Uh, kind of the four senses of scripture, which which are. Um, I mean, I guess it doesn't actually use those four senses. Like uh, those are kind of medieval uh, approach, but it is, I, I suppose, a useful categorization of. Okay, what are we going to get out of this? But okay, so if we want to get into the literal, but let's let's maybe back up a little bit and give some context. Yes. Definitely. So for because last time we we're looking at Psalm three in particular, uh, but where if we want to back up a little bit before this, you have the judges, right? And so the judges. Book of Judges, we have uh, 12 judges. These are not modern-day, like, um, Judge Judy or something like this, but these are charismatic military figures. Mm -hmm. And this is a time of moral chaos uh, prior to the kings, right? Uh, You have some, like uh, Athenial, uh, Ehud, Deborah, and so on, who are uh, more or less good judges. Uh, Then we have others who are, well, kind of a mixed bag, uh, Mm -hmm. say, like Gideon, for instance. And then some who just go astray. Uh, So Mm -hmm. thinking of Samson here in particular— and well, this may be, uh, and we've uh, some quotations sure, there mentioned sure, from yes. origin. But the the without a leader like Joshua, uh-huh. Israel seems to career out of control. And there's that last line. Is that where you're going with the last line well, of, of, please, of, yes, of, of, of judges there? Yes, please. Yes. Um, well, it's repeated uh, four times uh, at the very end of uh, uh, of judges. Let's flip back here. And uh, that basically in Israel, I'll get the right Judges line. 21, 25, which I recommend, I mean, if you're driving, uh, like I said, we'll read all this out loud and explain everything, but if you're comfortably sitting by your fireside, have your Bible open for this episode. Yes, but. well, that's right. So we will go through, through a few different passages, but in those days, uh, th- th- there, were no, uh, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what he thought best. So that's absolutely right. That's the, that's the motif. There was no king in Israel, so people did what was right in their own eyes. Okay, that's the literal, you know, literal historical meaning. Moses leads the people out of Israel, out of Egypt, out to say, but doesn't get them to the promised land. Joshua leads the people of Israel to the promised land to claim it, and then Joshua dies, and uh, that's the beginning. So you quoted the very last verse of the book of Judges. The very first verse, I'll just read it. I mean, oh, yeah. I don't even yeah. need the whole verse, but Please. the opening no, well, words. Let's, yeah. hear, let's hear it, yeah. Opening words. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites inquired of the Lord, who will go up for us against the Canaanites? So, the the scenario, the chaos and violence and anarchy of the book of Judges happens upon the death of Joshua. And then it ends by saying, the whole book of Judges ends by talking about, you know, in these days there was no king, so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now, so that's your literal historical thing, right? Joshua, Moses is the charismatic leader, he dies. Joshua takes over. He's the charismatic leader. He dies, and then it's chaos. God sends periodically these saviors or deliverers or judges um, for a period of time, and then and they're very ambivalent, and you know, but there's still a big gaping problem. There's no king. Yeah. Now, what's the allegorical meaning or the moral meaning? Right. Well, the name Joshua, of course, is the same name as Jesus. All right. Okay, uh, how is that? That seems so... Well, uh, I guess it would be more accurate to say that Jesus is the English translation of the Greek translation <laughs> of the Hebrew name uh, Yeshua, uh, which is Joshua in the English translation as well, right? Uh, basically, and you see this yeah. even, the book of Hebrews does a lot with this. Right. Yeah. Uh, the fact that the name Joshua is, is uh, the same as the name Jesus. Uh, Moses can't lead the people of Israel to the promised land, but Jesus does. Joshua does. You know, right. there's a, yeah. there's a, just like the law can't get us to salvation, but Jesus can. The, the law of Moses can't save us, but Jesus right. can save us. So, what Origen does is he does he makes quite a bit of hay out of this, and he contrasts the days of Jesus with the days uh, apart from Jesus. You know? yeah. So he says um, he, he talks about uh, the book of Malachi. For those who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing ah, in its wings. Yeah. So he says the days of Jesus are in ourselves when we are enlightened by Jesus and we're following Jesus uh, and thus we're holy and in line with him. In contrast to the days of evil. 
and he talks about how there, uh, you know, Lucifer is a bearer of light, oh, all right? Okay. He, he disguises himself as an angel of light, Paul yeah. warns us, right? Yeah. So we can follow that light, but that light is a false light. There's actually darkness at the end of it. And if we, fall, if we live in the days of evil, the days without Jesus, that oh. is going to lead us to catastrophe and disaster like we see in the book of Judges. And he actually and he makes other comparisons to uh, how Isaiah couldn't see the vision of God in Isaiah 6 until oh. the days of King Uzziah ended. Okay. <laughs> when King yeah. Uzziah dies, then Isaiah yeah. is able to see God. Right? Right. So the days of evil uh, are, are when we walk in the light of evil, the false light of evil. Whereas oh, okay. the days of Jesus are when we walk in the true light. And he quotes John's prologue. When we walk in the light that enlightens uh, every man. Right. Okay. Right? Those are, that's the Those light of the true around. days of yeah. Jesus. All so right. Yeah. right away here, that would be an example of a moral and allegorical reading okay. of this. Right? Yeah. Jud- Judges is showing us a world uh, in which people are living in the days of the false light. Right. Right. Um, not the light of Jesus, not the days of Jesus. Well, what's the remedy for that? God has to provide a king. Uh, br- yeah, yeah. And so th- that's well, that, that's part of the question is uh, it's sh- well, it's showing the need really for, for, for a king. Right. Mm-hmm. And or more particularly, not just any king, but leaders who are governed are guided by the wisdom of God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and so, again, the catastrophe in Judges is that we're left with a near liquidation of, of Benjamin uh, and the implosion of Israel, uh, the near implosion of Israel. So how can Israel function? Uh, and and okay, this is not necessarily a, a new question. And again, if we want to think of the panorama of salvation in Israel, it, it's a question that's as old as Eden. Uh, how can we live with obstinate, self-centered uh, uh, individuals yet flourish as children of God, mm-hmm. right? And so uh, that's, that, and, okay, maybe we don't have to go all the way back to Genesis. But if we go back to Exodus, uh, I think we can look at the middle of the Pentateuch at least, and we can see how this, this problem uh, remains there in the structure of the Pentateuch. So, it, I mean, most Gentile readers uh, are going to be familiar with Exodus, how, how what's, what's going on there. Because, I mean, what do you have? You have like, well, you have the, the the ten plagues. You have the Passover. You got the ten uh, commandments. But a, a lot of readers don't remember. Like, okay, how does the Exodus actually end? Because it's usually get bogged down in uh-huh. these instructions on uh, worship and 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 uh, law and uh, the tabernacle and stuff. So yeah, if we would just turn there, if you go to the end of of Exodus, like, do you, do you actually remember? Like, I'm just curious because most people don't remember. Like, what ends up happening Ooh, uh, in the end of Exodus? Yeah, before it goes into Leviticus, there. Yeah. Um, well, there's the shattering of the ta- two tables. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. After all so that, yeah, that's like 34. That. Like, you're talking like in chapter 40, basically. So, um, and there are some interesting bits. Yeah, with with the golden calf. I'm way after that. So, so how does it end? Like this. So, if you're at home, you can turn to yeah. You have the advantage of the chapter yeah, chapter so, 40. Chapter 40. So, yeah, that's interesting. Because the, 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 those chapters are still about the liturgical um, establishment, right, of the temple. Exactly. When people uh, fall off. And, uh, oh, interesting. Yeah, or, 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 oh, okay. Fall asleep, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, uh, so, chapter 40, the tabernacle is erected. Yeah. Oh, interesting. All right, all right. And then I think you're, are you referring to verse 34 onwards? Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory uh, of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, yeah, what's the, next, what's the next line? Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it. Okay. The glory so, of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Yeah. So then we're going to hear this amazing um, bit about the, the cloud, the pillar of cloud, and the fire that's going to lead Israel now in, in the wilderness as they continue going. But notice the problem here is that Moses cannot enter into the tent of mm-hmm. meeting. So it's, it's been constructed. God's glory is there. But again, this is because the sinfulness of humanity. Yeah. So this is a fundamental problem, again, going back to Eden, is how can we live as sinful creatures in the presence of the holy? Mm-hmm. Like the capital H, holy, uh, or the holy of holies, right? So how is this possible? And the middle of the Pentateuch, so this ending of Exodus, mm-hmm. as well as Leviticus and Numbers, are going to deal with that question. So if you just turn the page, or you already have turned the page, because it goes right into Leviticus. What's the opening line of Leviticus? The Lord summoned Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. Ah, so what we have there is, again, Moses is not 
in the tent. He's 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 uh, spoken to from the tent. Mm-hmm. Now, what you can have in, in Leviticus is uh, the kind of those three main. Uh, it's a kind of a chiastic structure, but it, it's going to look at ritual. Uh, sacrifice on one end, and then the other end is ritual uh, feasts. Uh, next uh, part of the chiasm would be uh, priests. So w- what does it mean, uh, the calling of the priest, uh, um, regulations for ordination, and so on? And then the third bit of it is going to look at ritual purity and moral purity. Okay, so so you have ritual sacrifice and festivals, you've got the regulations for the priests, then you've got purity, moral, and ritual. Okay, so it's kind of the classic structure. And then in the middle, you're going to have this bit about the scapegoat uh, and sacrifice. And so yeah, the, chapter 16. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right in the middle. And the very last two chapters line up with the middle two chapters, which is the uh, with the uh, ritual sacrifice with the scapegoat mm-hmm. and how this all works. Now, what does this have to do with the problem of Old Zedon? Well, go now to the opening line of Numbers. Mm-hmm. So if you turn there... Alrighty. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month, the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of the whole congregation of Israelites in their clans by ancestral houses, according to the number of names, every male individual, from 20 years old and upward. Yeah, okay, well, that's, that's, okay thank you. So, so that gives you... So the, uh, hence the title of the book. Hence, yeah. hence numbers, yeah, yeah. Uh, but if we're looking at the location, if we want to ca- connect this back to the end of Exodus, the beginning of Leviticus, where is Moses? The, in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting. Ah, right. So uh, now Moses is in the tent. Yeah. So what you have in Leviticus then are these regulations for how we can deal with the sin of, of, of Moses, yeah. right? And, and the purification for the priests and the people with, with these mechanisms. So that's why Moses ends up in the tent, right, when, when, when Numbers is starting up. Uh, now, that in mind, Judges, the book of Judges, is forcing us to revisit this question, mm-hmm. right? So how can the covenant be lived out, mm-hmm. right, um, amidst grievous uh, transgressions, relentless concupiscence, and lies that are fraught and fractured with violent outbursts? Mm-hmm. And Okay, that that's basically what we're. It's jarring, right? We, it's it's very disturbing to get get through um, all of, of judges, but that that's that's kind of what one of the questions that we're left with. Mm-hmm. Now, in English, uh, our um, Bibles, you're gonna have an interlude between uh, Judges and First Samuel, sure. which is Ruth, and I'll maybe make mention of that again later. But let's just go to Samuel now. So if you look at the opening of Samuel. Well, or like First Kings in some versions. Uh, oh, that's that's it worth pointing out. Okay. Uh, so, in um, the original um, Hebrew Bible, this would actually there's no First and Second Samuel. It's just Samuel. Uh, the, the 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 bit the why they call it First and Second is just because you know more than one scroll. Yeah, and in some translations there's First and all the way to Fourth Kings. Uh, but in any case, we'll, we'll go with the English and numbering. But uh, here it. How does it start out? So, because you mentioned kings, right? Yes. Um, do, so, uh, does it start out with a king? Does it start out with an important scribe or a judge or maybe a priest, um, or what have you? How, how does it start? It starts off with a certain man from Ramathaim, a Sophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, etc., who had a couple of wives. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and so we're going to hear about uh, the story in particular of one of them. We we hear that they annually go on a pilgrimage up to Shiloh, uh, important um, place of worship, and one of the the women is um, Hannah. And so we start with the story of Hannah. Okay, now her name means uh, grace or it can mean favor. But what is her plight essentially? So, I mean, what, what can we say? Do you, do you remember, like, what her issue or she like has childlessness? Right? That's right. So she's barren, uh, and this is a problem for her. Uh, she's there. Uh, she goes to the temple. Uh, she goes ahead, and uh, she's praying. She's quite distraught because one of her husband's other wives 
uh, Pania is constantly uh, taunting her, uh, lording this over and so on. And so she's really wounded uh, by, by her situation. And now let me suggest to you that she is a type of Eve. Uh, so now how, how is this, uh, how could this be that, that Hannah is a type of Eve? Well, and how about this? Let me start with the first point. <laughs> Despite his best intentions, um, Elkanah, her, her husband here, um, he's messed up. Okay, so he's he's distorted, uh, and we can see this uh, in concupiscence. Well, he has more than one wife. Why do you need two? Uh, all right. So this is this is deviating from the um, what we see in Eden, the the uh, prescribed uh, relationship between man and woman, a man and a woman. Uh, also, this is this is great when when he sees her crying what does he say oh, to her oh yeah that's a classic yeah. move um he says that, well he, he gives her um multiple more stuff than his other wife he's got he's got two wives and one of them is yeah. very fertile had is not so he gives her a double portion um and uh, yeah. when he sees her weeping he says uh, why do you weep why do you not eat why is your heart sad am i not more to you than ten sons yeah. Uh, well, she doesn't bother answering. Yeah. It's, it's, it's got to be like the best rhetorical question in the Bible. Uh, yes. yeah. Am I type better than tense? And so it's like, just watch her cry in the next scene if you want her answer. Yeah. Okay, so the evidence is an emphatic, no, you are not uh, anywhere near uh, that. And so here there's also the element of pride. Well, he, he's he, he's so blinded by his pride, he can't even see what her issue is, right? Yeah. He thinks, like, his just mere presence uh, should yeah. suffice for any desire of her heart. Yeah. Uh, he's also oblivious uh, to the predicament that Hannah is in, in, in that the promises to Abraham are descendants. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? So, yeah. so how can she live out uh, these promises uh, if, if that's the case? Who's not blind to her actual hardship is her rival, ah, so yes. Pania, uh, who who's going to rub it in, uh, and she's he's, she's going to really torment her with this. So here I would suggest Hannah is like a type of Eve in that she's approaching the gates of. Eden, a, a sanctuary, right? Because that's that's what Eden is. It's a sanctuary. So she's approaching the gates of a sanctuary. Um, she's. Surround, surrounded by well-intentioned men, <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. or but who happens to be really hapless. Um, she's also grappling with demons, mm. right? Uh, so I mean, it's certainly uh, 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 her her rival knows the her, her predicament and, and taunts her, and this is a kind of a torment, a demonic torment that she has to uh, I- endure, mm-hmm. and so she knows the pain of sin. Another reason, though, to think of Hannah in relation to Eve is context. We were just flipping through the Bible there a little bit, mentioned English Bibles. Well, what what divides Samuel and Judges in in our English Bible? Well, it's a story of another woman, Ruth, Ruth, uh, whose prominence is in the, well, one of the reasons uh, is in the genealogy of, of David, which harkens back to Genesis three fifteen, uh, from the from your seed will come the one who will crush the head of the serpent. So uh, this is a, a fascinating kind of a parallel there, and I might suggest um, Anne is an interesting fulcrum of figure to look at when it comes to the new Eve. So if we actually just look at uh, Anne, her when her prayer is answered, uh, she bursts out in this uh, a canticle. Uh, and this is divided really into uh, three parts. Uh, the, the, this canticle it's, it begins with an overture of praise. I don't know, your translation is a little bit better than mine. I don't know if you want to read that, but sure, sure. At um, least the first first two verses. But I have prayed and said, "My heart exalts in the Lord; my strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord; no one besides you." There is no rock like our God. Yeah, and so it's acknowledging the holiness of God amidst this uh, sinful and um, uh, fallen world that she's in. And this is very interesting when she says, uh, 
uh, I've swallowed up my enemies. So I think, wait a second, Hannah, what, how did you do that? <laughs> right? well, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, who are our enemies? Well, uh, <laughs> you, you, uh, Pen and I, right, sure. is the, the but, obvious but, one. But, 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 so she has doubt, mm-hmm. despair, yeah. and the devil, mm-hmm. right? The, these are the enemies that are plaguing her heart. Um, and, and so here, um, if we go to the next line, it, speak boastfully no longer. Uh, so who, she, who do you think she's talking to there, uh, right? Nor let arrogance issue from your mouths. For an all-knowing God is the Lord, a God who judges deeds. Now, in some ways, she might be thinking of, yeah, her rival. But really, it's also the devil, right? Mm-hmm. Don't speak to my heart boastfully anymore um, because God has defended me against who, right? Mm-hmm. The bows of uh, the mighty, which are broken. Mm-hmm. And, and if you go down to um, the next line, verse 5, uh, right, the barren. Uh, sorry, the wed, uh, the well-fed uh, hire themselves out for bread. Uh, well, who was hungry before? Mm. I mean, Hannah was given. You mentioned the uh, double portion, uh, right? right? So, yes. uh, like, was she like starving? <laughs> well, not uh, literally, perhaps. No, but no, no but but um, she lacked fulfillment, right? And the fulfillment in her own life and um, in the promises to Abraham. Uh, living this out, uh, and, and so here you would see this God's defense of 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 the poor uh, and the exaltation of the mighty. Now you might those words might be familiar to some of our listeners, sure. thinking of of Our Lady's uh, Magnificat. But if we go down to the end of this, or towards the end of it, halfway through verse eight, this is a the, the kind of the third aspect of this canticle. The first is kind of this overture of praise. The second one, which we just looked at, is kind of Hannah's life. Uh, and, and now we get to this interesting forward-looking element. So she's going to start speaking in the future tense. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, uh, and he has set the world upon them. Okay, that's past tense, but look at verse 9. He will guard the footsteps of of his faithful ones. So now it's, it's looking towards the future. But the wicked shall perish in darkness, for not by strength does man prevail. The Lord's foes shall be shattered. The Most High in heaven thunders. The Lord judges the ends of the earth. Now may he give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So this is a, 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 a fierceness to her prayer here of, of now this demand, this desire for a king who will be... Um, uh, who will lead us. Uh, and you know, some of our listeners might know this or may recall uh, some of the discussions. Anointed is the Hebrew word as Meshiach. In Greek, it's Christos, which is translated as Messiah or Christ. Mm-hmm. So this is the prayer for a Christ figure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, now I think you want you did you want to jump in there? And no, no, go ahead. Okay. No, uh, so this is, the, um, this is the desire. This is the desire is um, God will lift up those um, who are lowly opposed the proud will bring about um, a Messiah. And as the story progresses, we see some of this dynamism going on. Uh, there's there's the pride of Israel, which is evident when uh, they go out to battle against uh, uh, their enemies, and they they are bringing with them the Ark of the Covenant, right? So it's almost like the pride of Israel is on display in that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Ark of the Covenant, and we've seen them using this before. But the problem here is that well. They're using God like a puppet, yes. all right, or or some kind of mechanism that they can, you know, turn on to win a battle. Um, now the next major figure, who we we witness is Saul, mm-hmm. and Saul. I mean, is, we're going to say something similar going on that this pattern uh, in his ascent. Well, tall, Saul is tall, <laughs> he's handsome, he's brave, but he's obdurate, right, and and defiant, and mm-hmm. we see his. Uh, his descent, uh, I mean, there's this mental, uh, spiritual descent, and, and finally his own collapse where uh, he, he falls under his own sword. Uh, so you have this, um, I mean, part of his descent is um, as the ground beneath his feet begins to shift, he can't really handle it, right? Um, and in some ways, um, Saul does, I think, at least for myself, I don't know, he promises to remind a, a little bit of a Goliath in some ways because yeah. he's this tall, a military figure who hunts for David, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, and, and so um, 
All right, so you did the Ark of, we see of the Covenant with Israel and their pride and how they're brought low. We see the, that story with, with Saul. Now this brings us finally to, well, David, mm-hmm. right, um, who marks a bright contrast, uh, if we want to think of it like that, uh, with the life of, of, of Saul. I mean, how is he different than Saul? Well, is David tall and sure. conspicuous? Well, Hardly. Yeah. I mean, when Samuel shows up at his house, they forget he's even there. Yes. Uh, he has to ask a few times, like, okay, um, I mean, your dad and your brothers more or less forget about you. Um, mm-hmm. So he doesn't stand on a crowd. Um, so he's unlike the Sauls and Goliaths of, mm-hmm. uh, of this world. And crucially, mm-hmm. when David is presented with the occasion to kill his opponent, Saul, yes. he refrains, mm-hmm. uh, right? So, and, and why is that? Well, He's trusting in the Lord, yes. right? This is the Lord's anointed, yeah. right? His Meshiach. Yeah. So who am I, yeah. right? To, 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 and, and so. David doesn't grasp after power is a key thing, right? Well, well he's, yeah, and there he's doing what's least expected. I mean, I don't know if it was you, but for myself, like if someone's been trying to kill, I'm, I wouldn't, I don't think I would hesitate sure, uh, yeah. uh, twice. Self, self-defense, yeah. And, and but David does what's not expected, just as he's not expected to be chosen, the one who's chosen, and he trusts in God's mercy uh-huh. and providence, his guiding hand. So the question put to us here is, well, what about us? What type of life will we lead? Uh, so to other humans, I mean, uh, we might judge ourselves as taller or shorter, but I mean, in God's eyes, like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> right? Your, 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 your physical stature. Um, Instead, what is God after? Well, our 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 heart, our hearts, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, now, this get to the heart of the matter. Then, what's the problem? Well, mm-hmm. we're proud, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. We're we're we we are we're obdurate. We we fall into concupiscence and what Augustine calls the libido dominati. Uh, that's our um, desire to dominate others. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, as opposed to being receptive, uh, trusting in the providence, and ultimately yielding. Uh, uh, to God. So um, when you're in Hannah's situation or you're in David's situation and it seems like or every other human might say to you, well, it looks like God has abandoned you. Um, well, we see David as um, an example of what could be done. Right mm-hmm. Now, um, let's talk a bit about David's descent. <laughs> okay, so so that's the bit of the context sketching for his ascent. Um uh, and as you know, he's eventually anointed uh, king. Uh, he establishes his uh, political, uh, religious capital in Jerusalem. And he's a bit of a, I mean, he's a political military genius yes. of, of sorts, right? Is he not? Um, and everything seems to be going great. When you get to Second Samuel chapter 7, uh, this is this marvelous bit of uh, God's promise to him and his everlasting kingdom. And here now David is thinking of building a temple uh, to God. Uh, and, and, and all the rest. And, and so this seems like the fulfillment of what Hannah has sung, the promises to Abraham as well. Mm-hmm. Things seem to be going great. We have our Messiah. Everything's in place. Uh, now, where do things go wrong? And I think most of our listeners probably will think of at least one episode that goes horribly askew in David's life. So what, what usually comes the, to mind? I think most people would assume it's the Bathsheba it's affair. <laughs> In more fair in more ways than one would be where it all derails. But. It, 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 I, absolutely, so, I mean, David is supposed to be out in in, in battle. You know, it's at the, the turn of the year, uh, and instead he is, for reasons um, perhaps known only to David, uh, he's he's not right. Uh, and then we see how things uh, spiral out of control with adultery, murder, mm-hmm. which is precipitated by his indulgence. Right, so I think I think readers are probably uh, familiar with that uh, the whole affair with um, Uriah the Hittite uh, and um, uh, Bathsheba's uh, the affair with Bathsheba. But what about after that, right? So so how do things uh, 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 spiral uh, following that? Well, after David is confronted by uh, the prophet Nathan, that's in chapter twelve. Then there's repentance. All right. Um, here, let's go to chapter 13. And this, again, we're um, not highlighting these elements of, of David's life, again, to to uh, uh, 
lord it over him or, or be haughty or something like this. But it, 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 uh, we're looking at this, this darker side of the affairs uh, to kind of see how things, what, well, what not to do, but how things do unfold sure, yeah. in David's life. So if we go there, uh, let's, let's just start in chapter 13 of Second Samuel. Now, sometime later, the following incident occurred. David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar, and David's son Amnon loved her. So, all right. Um, it is repeated there twice, David's son. So in case you didn't know, Absalom and Amnon are brothers. Mm-hmm. And the, the biblical text is going to remind us of that. Um, he was in such straits over his sister Tamar that he began, it became sick. Since she was a virgin, Amnon thought it was impossible to carry out his designs toward her. Uh, all right. So uh, I guess a few things here we can say with this opening bit is, um, in some ways, Amnon has, he's in the same plight as Hannah. You think, well, okay, how is that? Well, uh, his desires have been frustrated. Yes. Okay, they can't be played out. Now, he's also unlike Hannah in some important ways, is that his designs, his desires are disordered. Yes. Okay, so incest in, the, in particular here. Um, now, let's see what happens next. Verse 3. Now, Amnon had a friend named uh, Jonadab, uh, son of David's brother Shimnai, who was very clever. Uh, okay. Now, you, we, the term is not the exact same no, as, as the creature but, in, yeah. in, in, uh, who shows up in Eden, but it certainly is evocative. Yeah. Uh, this clever... Yeah, the, the, the serpent was more clever than all the other beasts <laughs> of the field. And similarly, Jonadab is a very crafty man, a uh, very... Honestly, it could, um, the Hebrew could actually be even translated wise or skillful. Um, although, as this uh, footnote here from the NAV points out, uh, that uh, in the categories of like the wisdom literature, Jonadab is a fool. Uh, right, right. <laughs> but, yeah, he's, yeah. but he's in a worldly sense, he's very clever, as we'll see. Right, he comes up with a scheme here. Right. So just and, and I and I um, I will just highlight this a bit harder. Uh, you know, Hannah desires something, but she trusts God for it. Yes. Uh, David, I mean, but did he desire the kingship or not? Who knows? But he doesn't grasp after it. Right. right? Yes. Uh, Amnon desires for his sister. Yes. Right? But Jonadab, who's very clever, says, no, no, grasp after it. Here's a scheme you can use. <laughs> right. To get a hold of her. So. Y- yes. Involving a lot of trickery yeah. and deceit. You know? Right. So he grasps after, she, he grasps after this forbidden fruit, you know. Right, and so whereas um, Hannah, when she is in straits because her designs are, she goes where? Well, she goes to the temple and prays. And it, it, there, what's fascinating about that scene of Hannah praying with without speaking is um, she's accused of being drunken, right? So, so sure, even yeah. though her her designs are um, uh, trying to come to fruition by going to the Lord, she's mocked for that. Uh, I'm mistaken. I mean, and that just shows the. Um, and later on, to Eli's defense, because Eli, who makes the mistake of thinking she's a drunkard, um, it says, like, the word of the Lord was rare in those days in Israel. So it seems like not many people were uh, on fire for the Lord and perhaps, you know, obviously practicing a type of paganism because speaking out loud, like Jesus says, like the Gentiles just blabbing on all these prayers, like, that's not how God works. You could just list off prayers and prayers and prayers and prayers, uh, and then you've unlocked the key because you said enough of the formula, so God's going to work there. There's, a, there's, another, there's another subtext there if we read it through salvation history. I don't want to dwell on this too, too long, sure, sure, I sure. want to go where yeah. this is going, but yeah. um, Paul says in Romans, we don't know what to pray for, so we have to let the Holy Spirit pray uh, on us. Yes. And yeah. when, where, where else can you think of somebody being mistaken for being drunk? Yeah. Acts, oh. Acts chapter 2. Yeah. Oh, yeah. these men are drunk. No, right. we're not drunk. It's not, not that time of day where people oh. get drunk, right? Uh, because the Holy Spirit has come upon them, and now they're proclaiming the word of the Lord. So I think not only does Hannah going to God to, you know, she has a desire, so she goes to God to, for it instead of trying to get it herself, uh, like Abraham might have done with Sarah or something. Right, right yes. Um, it's Abraham and Sarah did with Hagar. Not only is she going to God, but she's actually, God is praying through her. She's right. like letting God transform her desires, right? Letting okay. the Holy Spirit well, guide her. I right? don't think that's a digression. Because okay, okay, right. if we go back to our text where we just left off there in Second Samuel 13, um, uh, Amnon's, um, where he's going for help is not the Spirit of God. Absolutely, right? yeah. he, He's going to this crafty, friend um, and who basically is giving him license to indulge in his desires mm-hmm. and, and the plan that he comes up with is is a, is a wretched one but essentially yeah. he's going to feign illness uh, and preying on the good nature of his sister Tamar yeah. uh, he's going to um, 
ask for uh, some food that, that you'll prepare and, and, and bring it to them. So if you go down to uh, verse 6, Amnon now feigns being sick. Uh, this, is, this is the idea. Uh, but look who visits him. This, this is fascinating. Mm. The king came to visit him. And Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and prepare some fr- uh, fried cakes before my eyes that I may take nourishment from her hand. Mm-hmm. Now, what a curious detail. David catches wind that his son is ill. And so perhaps as a good father, mm-hmm. he goes and, and wants to check this out. I mean, your father visits you, but it's more than just the father. It's the king himself mm-hmm. of the land. Uh, maybe that will help lift your spirits. And why does David say, okay? Like, well, is, is like, what, you know, like we can, hell, someone else can feed you or like, I'm here. Like, isn't that good enough? Mm-hmm. Uh, right? So, but David then sent a message home to Tamar, please go to your brother, uh, Amnon, and prepare some nourishment for him. So she goes, and um, this is when the um, uh, infidelity, the, the, the wretched assault on her uh, now transpires. Look at, she goes in to get, bring him food, and he seizes her at that point and uh, uses her sexually. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, okay, so how does this um, connect here a little bit with uh, David's indulgence with Bathsheba. Well, he is, uh, first of all, entertaining lust. Uh, second of all, he consults with his servants. Oh, yeah, who's that Who's that over there, right? Um, and, and so here, uh, Amnon is also consulting, right, with, with some, uh, his friend. Um, but then he's going to implicate others in his crimes, whether it's a servant, like David does, right? So other, whether it's the servants or, or Joab and so on. Yes, yeah. and, and look what... Amnon is doing. Yeah. Amnon. He is implicating David himself yeah. in his crimes. Uh, so uh, his desire is completely self-destructive. Now, we mentioned briefly um, the prophet Nathan who shows up and provides a corrective, yeah. a, a prophetic voice uh, with a parable to, to help David see what's going on. There's a prophetic voice which is uttered here to Amnon, yeah. uh, and that comes from uh Tamar uh, herself, uh, where she says in verse um, uh, 12, No, my brother, do not shame me. That is an intolerable crime in Israel. Do not commit this insensate deed. Where would I take my shame? And you would be most discredited, a man in Israel. So please speak to the king. He will not keep me from you. So basically, she is, uh, well, Amnon is ignoring this prophetic voice. You'll be the most discredited in all of um, Israel. Uh, And so this is... uh, I mean, Amnon is a type of a variation of David, but in more extreme. Yeah. Right. Uh, he, he he's taking it even further. All right. Enter in. Right, and I just need to stress sure. this. Okay. Yeah. She says, "If you asked the king, he he wouldn't withhold me from you." So this is important too. He could go through this by requesting she oh. be given to him. Right. But no, he's going to grasp after her himself. So again, yeah. it's it's. I think this is also Edenic. Right, it's kind of this idea that maybe if Adam and Eve had waited and matured, <laughs> maybe we'll, right, there God had things in store for them, but they grasped after that fruit instead. Right, um, Hannah waited, God provided her son. David waited, God provided the kingship. Perhaps if Amnon had requested and been humble and receptive, he could have received uh, Tamar, but he grasped after it after being tempted by his very wise friend Jonadab. Right, so there's a, yeah. that structure is present here. Yeah, you know? yeah, and. Uh, and probably just, I mean, people you can ask for all this stuff in the world that you want Does, doesn't mean you're going to get it, right? But but if you're asked, at least you can be corrected. Yeah. So in him at least asking, I mean, Tamar is, you know, suggesting, well, you can ask, well, and then obviously, you know, you'll be corrected by that. Or at least, you know, we'll have some sure. correction going on here. But uh, that's, not, that's not what unfolds. Um, now, uh, who, so this unfolds uh, here in the next scene. Uh, what's the reaction? Uh, this is verse 20. Uh, yep. So here, well, they end up halfway through verse 20. But Tamar remained grief-stricken and for long in the house of her brother Absalom. King David got word of the whole affair. He became very angry. He did not, however, spark the resentment of his son Amnon, whom he favored because he was his firstborn. Now, this is... Um, what are we to make of this? This, I think, is one of the key flaws in David as a parent. 
he, just as Amnon is indulging the desires of his flesh, David is also indulging his flesh. Mm-hmm. And technically, it's the flesh of his flesh. So it's his offspring. Yeah, yeah. So he's indulging his offspring, which is a type of flesh, uh, in, this, in this. So instead of having this corrective and in, uh, punishment, uh, this, this um, realignment for Amnon, he doesn't. Mm-hmm. He doesn't. Um, and, and so what ends up happening? If you leave the next verse, Absalom, moreover, said nothing at all to Amnon, although he hated him for having shamed his sister Tamar. So Absalom and David share the same reaction. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they're abhorred at what happened. But they also, in, in some ways, behave very similar in that they say nothing. Mm-hmm. Right Now, for Absalom, it's, he's actually uh, going to scheme uh, in the background uh, of, of what's going to um, uh, happen next. Uh, and, and so what he does is he prepares an elaborate meal. Uh, he, it, it, I mean, two years have passed. Uh, he prepares his meal. He invites uh, the other princes and uh, kin and so on. Uh, what's interesting is he makes uh, use uh, of, of wine in, in this as well. Uh, and then... Um, once the deed is exposed, when when uh, Amnon is is, is slaughtered, uh, then he flees to uh, another uh, territory. And as he goes on, so uh, interesting parallel here. Who else makes use of of, of wine to try and uh, have their uh, schemes devised? Well, that's uh, David, right? With Uriah, he tries he tries to mm-hmm. get him inebriated so he can cover up his sins or whatever. Well, yeah. here again, something happened, uh, kind of same tools being used here uh, by, by the son. Um, now, Amnon doesn't see it ha- coming, but he dies this unexpected sudden death at the hands of, of his brother, who, as noted then, has to then go ahead and head, flee uh, for the hills. But um, here, once he does, um, yeah, I mean, there's the whole episode of, of how he finally, uh, re- Absalom returns uh, sure. back, uh, w- which we uh, mentioned last time. Uh, but what is David doing about it? So, so what is so what is David going to do about Absalom? So, I, I like what 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 actually does? I mean, he, he exiles him. Uh, then he when he, he kind of lets him back, but doesn't let him anywhere near himself. Uh, it's like two years, right? Absalom lives in Jerusalem without coming near the king. Um, and, it's, and then Absalom has to kind of force his way into David's presence by committing arson. Yeah, yeah. well, it's <laughs> but, Joab's field, right? Yeah. That, that he decides he he's going to burn field, down. Yeah. Um, and, and so here things have escalated where correction is not coming forth from the parent. Mm-hmm. Right, so it, Absalom is no fool. He's, he's seen mm-hmm. the consequence Amnon faced, which was... Nothing, Nothing yeah. uh, right? So he realizes that now he's back. Well, I need to get someone's attention. Well, I'm going to torch uh, Joab's yeah. crops. Well, of course I'm, I'm going to get away with this, or, or maybe I'll be deaf. But if I get away with it, then yeah. um, I, I, I'm going to get away with it. Uh, so he's like, if I'm guilty, let him put me to death. Is, is basically. Uh, but he has good reason to think his dad will not put him to death. I, exactly. <laughs> what, what reason would he have to think that would happen? You know, because he, he hasn't done it before, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and so then he's going to set himself up as his own judge, a type of king. Um, and mm-hmm. here he's going to set the people at odds with the rule of law. Mm-hmm. And, and so this indulging this this um, mm-hmm. fruit which takes place as rotten, corrupt yeah. fruit is now spreading mm-hmm. throughout. Um, Israel and and the parallelism with David um, it, it, the the height of Absalom's rebellion uh, I think happens at the rooftop where he takes advantage of David's concubines yeah, having, having and driven David out and he wants d- to establish his d- dominance d- so he goes d- and yeah. sleeps with them all all ten of them publicly brazen yes in yes. brazen daylight which again parallels back to the father's rooftop. Uh, uh, indulgence and sin, which was trying, uh, he's trying to be fair, to, uh, fair to about. It. Like you know, I mean, he yeah. didn't want people to know what was happening. Whereas Absalom now, same impulse, mm-hmm. but in front of everyone. So the sins that seem small grow up into being egregious. This horrible tentacle, yeah. right? Which 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 is now uh, taking off. So I guess if we uh, 
can fit this together then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what are we to make of this dark side of, of this indulgent parent? What can we learn of uh, mistakes? Okay, well, I think back to yeah, our sure. previous episode <laughs> yes. on uh, violence in the Old Testament where we talked a bit about, I think this has come up in other episodes too, that one of the ways that the church fathers interpret stuff in the Bible that has to do with babies or infants or children is that it's ultimately ourselves, right? Like uh, the, the child is father to the man, or maybe you could say you know, the, yeah. the, the, you know, you are the father of yourself or the parent of yourself. You know, your soul is your child, and the choices you make bring that child up for good or for ill, right? So in the Proverbs where it talks about, you know, punish your kids so that they don't go astray, Primarily, that, that's a reference to yourself. You know, like get yourself yeah. under control yes. with the system. Don't, don't right? spare the rod. Exactly, yeah. yes. Don't spare the rod in the, in the form of, I mean, not to say you shouldn't be a, a strong parent who uses discipline when necessary, um, but that severity should really be directed at yourself, right? Right, um, yes. So if we take the kind of allegorical moral look at this, yeah. I think we'd see that David, um, perhaps in this way, represents uh, ourselves, and yeah. Absalom represents the son, right? And like you said, sins that begin smaller right like david doesn't directly kill uriah he tries to keep his uh his use of Bathsheba. there's some question about whether it's an affair i mean he's in right. a position of power over her yeah right. one could construe it as a kind of rape arguably but whatever right. yeah. now uh that's that's terrible but at least he kind of has some decorum about it well his son absalom uh is going to be hit that on steroids Right, right. Yes. Uh, he's going to yeah openly um, take advantage of these women and wreck their lives because even when David gets back into power, he has to kind of put these women into like seclusion because he can't be with them anymore. They can't go out and get married anymore, but he feels bad for them. So the best yeah. to do is just like make put them into some essentially make them into nuns, I guess. Right. <laughs> right? So yeah. so that's you know he wrecks all their lives. Um, he he does use violence. He kills um, openly right people who are in his way. Uh, Something that's interesting too is, uh, well, let I me mean, I'll say this. But so part of it is uh, Absalom represents what can happen to our souls if we let these peccadillos live. Right? I mean, there's that, that's right. there's that terrible verse in Psalm 137, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Take the little ones and dash them against the rocks. Well, yeah. you, know, you read that as the way that Origen and Jerome and all that do. You know, you take your little peccadillos, your little sins, dash them against the rock that is Christ. Well, what if you yeah. don't do that? Well, they grow up into Absalom. Right. right. They grow yes. up and they. Uh, and, and you lose control, right? This is another thing about well, mastering the passions is that like you're yeah. supposed to be, you know, going, you know, it's Plato and all this, and your, your reason's supposed to rule over you. Uh, it's supposed to be God's viceroy, you, yes, know, like yes. John, you know, like the poetry says. Yeah. Um, but if you let your passions take over, then the, they usurp that, and your passions rule you, and that's what happens and, with Absalom, right? It takes over the kingdom. And, yes, and, and all David could think of is my son Absalom. Right, so so, so yes. his passions are taken over to the extent that he becomes blinded to any corrective, and he's consumed, absorbed by the wrong things. Uh-huh. Right, I mean, there's, certainly there could be some degree of appropriate mourning, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's not like uh, yeah. He, I, I think of someone who, let's say you're someone who's really we're going to do an episode on this, so I'll use the example of video games, right? Okay. Maybe you're someone who really likes playing video games, and maybe that's fine. But if you start neglecting your prayers and your scripture readings and your homework for video games, yeah. uh, it'll take over your life. And then at that point, would, the any, would that, any of our listeners do that? I can't think? imagine. No, not if, okay. not if they're taking time to listen to them. <laughs> okay. Unless they're multitasking, <laughs> oh, to no. and playing video games, okay. which is maybe fine. Put, put that console down. Okay. Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the case where maybe Control. for some yeah. people you've got to kind of just cut that right out and quit video games altogether. Right. And that might be really painful. You might mourn over that because video yeah. games have you know value and merit in themselves. But if it's taking over your kingdom, you've got to be harsh right. with it, right, in yes. some cases. And yet and it's okay to mourn. Like you're allowed to, you know, there, there's mortification is painful. Yeah. But don't mourn too much. Get over it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? right. uh, which is what's going to happen with Absalom, right? When Absalom dies and David's going to mourn, he's going to mourn too much. He'll finally... He's got to he's have another prophetic voice say, snap out of it. And right. get, back, get back to work ruling your kingdom, you know? Yes, yes. So that's one application, maybe. would be, you know, if Absalom is your soul, uh, you want to be, uh, you, want, you want to recognize that your own sins are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yep. I'd probably, and on top of that, I'd also suggest it's literally true if you're a, if you're a parent. Well, right? that, that, <laughs> I think that might be a second, a, yeah. a second application is uh, for a, a child to be receptive to correction from a parent. I mean, I don't like to be corrected. I'm assuming you don't like either. I don't, I don't know many people who 
ask for correction. There's some exceptions, but yeah. very rare, right? So this is not something we want, but perhaps to see it as a grace, mm-hmm. uh, right? Uh, to to draw us, put us back on track. And I guess, and then from the parent perspective is, yeah, correction is needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so this... Well, David makes kind of two mistakes that seem like they're opposite, but they're not, right? First, he's indulgent towards Amnon, right? Yeah. So he just doesn't correct him in that sense. He lets it happen. Then he's he's mad at Absalom, um, but he doesn't correct him. He's so angry he won't even talk to him until he's yeah. forced to. Right. And maybe some parents feel that way about their kids, that they've done something so awful that they're not even worth engaging with. Well, that's right. actually that's just a, that's actually a form of indulgence, too. Right. Because you're, you're not yes. taking that. Sometimes it's, pain, well, it's, it's as painful to go to a uh, child you love and correct yeah. them as it is to go to a child who you have trouble loving. Well, you need to choose to love them, right? I mean, David, I mean, it's good that he tries to reconcile with Absalom, kind of, but a true reconciliation would have been like a forgiveness and uh, a penance, maybe. You know? you, and that, that requires humility, right? Because there's some, you, parts, yeah, yeah. Cause again, if you don't, someone you don't want to talk to for whatever reasons, well, there's a certain pride that needs to mm-hmm. diminish so that. Um, that can take place. So uh, I think here, I know we're coming to the end of our time, but... Uh, you can go back and listen to our Psalm 3 episode to get into more of the meat of what really plays out in Absalom's rebellion. Uh, I will say something that I think is interesting about okay. Absalom. But, sure. um, yeah, maybe this is all I'll say about this. You know, you could look at Saul and say, you know, Saul's doing a bad job. David, you really ought to be the true king. Yeah. That would have been... I'm sure that was tempting. Like, in a genuine, selfless way for him to be like, it would be the best thing for Israel right now if I became king. Um, but he trusted in the Lord, right? And God yeah. provided that. Absalom, similarly, has some legitimate grievance. With David. You know, he's, when he stands at the gate and says, yeah. you know, David won't hear you and because people are coming to David for judgment. And yeah. uh, David, Absalom stands at the gate and says, oh, David's too busy. He's not judging you. Now, it's possible Absalom's lying to get people's support. Yeah. But, you know, that's kind of how he's been acting. <laughs> right. He's not right. been weighing in as a yes. judge. So there could yeah. be some merit to what Absalom is saying. So perhaps Absalom also thought, you know what, at least I get the job done. You know, I, yeah. I, I saw something, right? Uh, yeah. And, and so but what I'm trying to say here is that's why it's so easy to be self-deceptive. Oh, I see. Right? Okay. I'm not trying to say, like, oh, Absalom, you know, I, who, first of all, who knows what would have happened in the Lord's plan? Like, maybe, yeah. the, maybe God would have made Absalom king uh, if, if, you know, he had trusted in the Lord and deferred to him. Um, but the point is, like, he, he thought that he knew what was best, and he grasped after it, rather right. than yes. saying, yeah. God, David is bad at this. He's a bad parent, and he's a bad king. I think I can help. Please, you know, do what you need to. <laughs> let me, let me, you know, and even with Amnon, right? Like, there were yeah. procedures he could have used to deal with Amnon. Yes, <laughs> right? yeah, yes. Um, it, even if it seemed like God wasn't providing justice, there were uh, mechanisms for it, uh, but he seized after it. And, and this is why he's such a much like Saul and, and maybe David, he's such an interesting, tragic figure. Because I really, I can see how a lot of this could have had good motivation to it. Um, that the devil then twists, right? Yes. And which is why I think, in, I see him as ultimately as being another figure like Amnon, who uh, grasps after the fruit. Which is why it's so interesting that his death is him getting tangled up in a tree. Right, from yeah, from a tree. Because in a way yes. that's metaphorically what happens to Adam and Eve. Yes. <laughs> is yeah. that they, yeah. they reach for the, tr- the tree and they get stuck in it. Yeah. And die there, you know. In a way, this is the other thing about Origen. Uh, when Origen says, you know, and, and Joshua died and the days of Jesus ended, uh, Origen, he compares that to mortal sin. Right? Like when we, when we sin, in a sense, Jesus okay. dies within us. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, so the whole nation, in some ways, right, has a kind of mortal sin in grasping after uh, power, right, through Absalom. And uh, there needs to be a restitution for that, which is. Uh, What's funny is uh, God will knock you off your throne, which is which is also symbolically what happens when when Absalom gets yeah. caught and his and his donkey leaves him behind. <laughs> yes. His seat is yeah. taken from him, and uh, he's tried to lift his head up, right? Symbolically, he's tried to raise his own head up and look right. where it's gotten him. It's got him stuck in the tree, right? Oh yes, so he's uh, lost his throne and his is like it was that Psalm three, like the Lord lifts up my head, right? So now his head he's lifted his own head, and this is where he's ended up. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, what we need to strive for are uh, having the days of Jesus within us. Right? Yeah, and you, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and aligning ourselves to that. having having that true light uh, that comes from Christ. So, uh, yeah, so there would be some moral and uh, allegorical uh, uh, interpretations of this. Um, is there anything you wanted to kind of uh, what, include what, this with? I, I think it's fitting just to revisit Hannah and uh, in her prayer uh, one more time. It's. Uh, her heart exalts in the Lord, mm-hmm. right? So, so this is what uh, uh, her strength, her horn is is lifted up, right? In, in God, 
Um, and so our, I guess the um, the swollen up of our enemies, because you mentioned like uh, Psalm 137 and Origin, I mean, takes that and I think a very helpful way of looking at it. Well, yeah, I think that's what Hannah's talking about here too. Yeah. Swollen up her enemies, uh, right? And rejoicing in the victory on the Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so it's not to speak boastfully, but to see how things are placed in our hands mm-hmm. by the Lord to, when we have that receptivity, how he defi- uh, defends us uh, and, and fills us with, um, or he's the one who allows us to reach our true fruition uh, and to really actually be fulfilled from the hunger which uh, continually um, mm-hmm. uh, it, it uh, is operative in our hearts, uh, right? Uh, so, uh, yes, and I guess, um, yeah, that's it. That's like the what's lifted up, well, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. So we are lifted up in, in Him. Um, so I think maybe to close, um, let's um, invoke the intercession of um, the new Eve, Our Lady, as we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.